All right, welcome back to the pre-TI uh, team review and preview, um, where I go over every single team that, atten that is attending TI's uh, past year of DPC Dota. Um, and strictly DPC Dota, not going over any outside tournaments or any, like, any tournament that was not part of the DPC circuit, which is basically just the two DPC seasons, as well as the two majors, and then the qualifiers. Um, Next up on our list, and the fourth team, fourth of six of the six teams that made it through uh, through regional qualifiers, we have North America's own team, Undying. And this is a team that I'm really looking forward to this year at TI. I think a lot of people um, are really underestimating North America. You know, it's, an, it's a common meme that North America is not the best region at Dota, but Evil Geniuses is looking solid this year, and Quincy Crew also is looking pretty solid. And this is another team that has been lo looking pretty consistently solid. Uh, throughout this year they've been I'd say they're a step below Quincy Crew and Evil Geniuses I think Evil Geniuses are like the S tier North American team Quincy Crew are like an A tier team and these guys are probably a B tier team where they haven't quite been able to beat them consistently those top two teams Quincy Crew and EG but they've been competitive with them and so looking over some stats now this is the video I wanted to spend more time on so that SG esports game uh, video that I did um, I still had the same stats and stuff, but I didn't cover as many games, so a lot of their win rates were really inflated. This one, I covered both Season 1 and Season 2 um, of the games they played against other teams here on this board, as well as every single game for their qualifiers, which was not a lot. They only played 9 games in their qualifier. They did not drop a single game in their qualifier. So yeah, these guys are a step above all of the other teams in NA except Quincy Crew and Evil Geniuses. They find themselves similar to Elephant where they are very reliably able to beat all the lower tier teams, but they just couldn't quite keep up with the upper tier teams. Um, so yes, jumping into their season and season one of the NA DPC, they finished, they actually tied for first place with Quincy Crew and EG. Uh, there was a little bit of a triangle where uh, Undying actually beat Quincy Crew, Quincy Crew beat EG, and then EG beat Undying. So there was a tie for first place where every single team was 6-1, and one, and Undying lost both of the best of ones. They had a best of one against both of those teams, and they lost both of them. So because of that, they missed out of the tournament. If they had won a single one of those, they would have been going to the first major. But nope, they get third place after losing those tiebreakers, so they secure themselves 200 points. Uh, following that, we had Season 2 of the NADPC, where they finished third place. This time, there was no ties. They just finished with a 5-2 and two record, and they earned themselves 200 more DPC points. Now, they finished with 400 points total. Um, however, that was not an, close enough to qualify them for TI. I believe it was over 800 points you needed to qualify for this TI, just based off of other teams and their results. Um, so overall, in the entire DPC, they finished 20th place, and they finished third place in the region. Um, as they finished third place in both uh, DPC seasons, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, looking now, and it should be also noted that all of their losses in Season 1 and Season 2 were strictly against Quincy Crew and EG. They beat every single team. Whether they dropped a game or not, they beat every single team that was below them. So, again, these guys are a cut above all the other teams in NA except for these two. Um, so, yes, now looking at the games that they actually did play against Evil Geniuses and Quincy Crew, um, jumping all the way back to February 2nd at the start, uh, it was actually the midway point of the NATPC Season 1. Uh, they played against Evil Geniuses and they lost that one too well. And then about three weeks later, two and a half weeks later, they play against Quincy Crew and they win that one 2-1. to one. That was a, uh, a really good best of three series for Team Undying, showing that they've got a lot of potential. As that Evil Geniuses series was the only one they lost in the entire season besides those tiebreakers. Um, so yes, they go into the tiebreakers three days later where they lost both of their series one nothing. So, uh, again, a little unfortunate. They just needed to win one of those to attend the major and they didn't quite make it. Um, skip it forward another two and a half months to season two. They play against EG where they lose two nothing. So it's notable that they played five games against EG throughout all this and they didn't win a single one. Um, so EG is just far superior to these guys. They just have, and a lot of the games have been sub 30 minutes. EG handles these guys pretty well. And then Quincy Crew, they lose that one 2-1. Two one. So again, they're competitive with Quincy Crew, but they just aren't able to consistently beat them, at least enough to get themselves spot into ma spots in the majors. As North America, just like South America, only has two slots for majors. So again, it's really unfortunate because they're a really talented team, but they just haven't been able to show it on an international level, at least until now. We're going to have to see how they do it. TI. Looking now at their stats. Um, now, a lot of these stats... It's a little bit uh, misleading because all of their losses pretty much came from these teams here, 
whereas all of their wins came from the qualifier. Again, they didn't lose a single game in the qualifiers. They went 9-0, and whereas uh, in their total record, they went 12-9. and So they were, they were only 3-9 and in total against these guys here. So, um, yeah, with all that balanced out, the very uneven sides of that, uh, they went f overall 5-4 and four on Radiant, 7-5 and five on Dire. So a slight preference, uh, not really a slight preference, but... A slight preference for Dyer. They they had one more games that they had lost. Uh, six and five in first pick and six and four in last pick. Um, their radiant first pick win rate was actually one and three. Uh, the majority of the time they got radiant first pick, they were against Evil Genius or Quincy Crew, so they lost the majority of those. Uh, radiant second pick eighty percent. Dyer first pick uh, seventy one percent, going five and two, and then Dyer second pick going two and three. Again, they had got that orientation a lot when they played against Evil Geniuses and Quincy Crew. Uh, game ones, they are five and five. Game twos, they are uh, five and three. And the reason there's more game ones than there are game twos is because I'm including the best of ones in there. So there were ten total game ones, eight total game twos, and then game threes, they were two and one in total. Uh, they did not have a game four or five in their uh, in their grand finals. They swept that one three zero against four zoomers. Uh, looking at their most played heroes throughout these twenty one games that they've played. Uh, Hoodwink with five, Morphling, Enchantress, Marana, Nyx Assassin, and AA with four. They had a lot of variation in their drafts. They did not play a lot of hero, they did not play a specific hero a lot of times. Hoodwink, they had played a lot more throughout the back half of it, uh, specifically in the qualifiers. They played a lot of it, and it's probably because, like I was saying earlier with South America with SG Esports, but Evil Genius has made a lot of heroes look really good in that last patch, whether it would be uh, it was mostly Ice Ice Ice, but Crit 2, making the Hoodwink look good. Uh, the Offlane Viper, the Offlane Broodmother. Um, of course, Nygma had that uh, that AA and Dragon Knight uh, influence on a lot of regions. Um, the reason that hero was so popular, same thing for Winter Wyvern. And so because, uh, and so a lot of those heroes that they played a lot with, they did in fact win. Uh, AA, they went 4-0. and Morphling, they went 4-0. and And Hoodwink, they went 4-1 and as well. Um, so that one loss was against Quincy Crew, I believe. Um, looking at their worst heroes now, they had Leshrac, who went 0-3. All these heroes they played against uh, Evil Geniuses or Quincy Crew, of course, because they didn't lose in qualifiers. Uh, Leshrac 0-3, Earth Spirit 0-3, and, and then Void Spirit 0-2. There were a bunch of other heroes that were 0-2 as well, but I figured I'd throw Void Spirit on there. Uh, most banned by them. So they banned a total of 61 heroes. That's over half of the hero pool across just 21 games. So again, a lot of variation in this team. Um, amongst them, the most were Medusa with 8, Terrorblade with 7, so two of the strongest uh, carries of last patch, as well as Naga Siren, which they had banned a lot against Evil Geniuses specifically, because Arteezy is a god on that hero, and then Keeper of the Light, which is actually interesting, because I don't think a lot of teams were really banning that hero a lot. It was mainly towards Season 1, so it's possible that it was just Season 1 influence, and it was a new patch, and a lot of people thought this hero might be good. That's when they initially changed him. Um... But yeah, six bans on Nagasar and Coddle, and their most banned four, they banned a total of 50, uh, they had, uh, oh sorry, they had uh, a total of 54 different heroes banned against them. Um, and so they had Alchemist banned six times, which is a bit interesting because I don't think any other team was really banning uh, or playing Alchemist. It's kind of like OG where they just have that one player who can specially play it very well, so that for OG that was Seb. Um, so it's worth banning it just because they, they're super comfortable on it, as well as uh, Nyx Assassin, Viper, and Invoker are also banned six times against them. Uh, looking at their active roster and their po uh, past uh, successes at TI. Um, starting off, we have Tomato, who in TI7 finished 13th to 16th place. Um, that was the highest he placed. Uh, Bryle and Saberlight actually have not played at an international yet. Uh, this is going to be their first time. In TI8, Bryle finished second place in the qualifiers. And in TI9, Saberlight finished third place in the qualifiers. I believe they were both playing from the European region at that point, too. So a lot of these guys coming over from the European region and playing here in NA. Uh, Moon Meander, he had finished ninth to 12th place at TI5 and TI6. And then Dubu actually finished fifth to sixth place at TI6. Um, and finally, looking at their team record now, they finished 3 1 and 1. Um, that's excluding the best of ones and the best of five. Um, their average GPM across all of the games here, specifically just the games, uh, was 2363. Uh, their average XPM, which was pretty high, uh, 2872. It's a lot lower than what it was listed in the qualifiers. In the qualifiers, these guys had the highest XPM of any team. It was like 3163 or something like that. It was ridiculous. It was even higher than uh, Team Elephant, who absolutely stomped their uh, qualifiers as well. 
Um, their average KDA was an astounding 5.79. It was above seven in the qualifiers. Like I said, these guys didn't lose a single game. They, they had very good stats in the qualifiers. And their average match duration was as short as 35 minutes and 43 seconds. Now, a lot of that comes from them stopping games in the qualifiers, and a lot of that comes from getting stopped by EG. Like I said, a lot of their games against EG were sub-30 uh, sub minutes, so... Uh, yeah, not really a huge surprise to see that they're sub 30 minutes, uh, sub 40 minutes uh, for their average match duration overall. But yes, uh, like I said, these guys are one of the most, uh, what, one of my most anticipated teams. I'm really interested to see if they can actually pull through and beat some of the top teams because it seems like that just seems to be their struggle. I think against a bunch of the other teams in the that made it through qualifiers, they'll have uh, a pretty good time against. But as, and I think if, if they can make it to the lower bracket, they could go on a little bit of a run and surprise some people. I really think if anyone's going to surprise some people, it's Team Undying. Like, these guys haven't really gotten a lot of the credit that they deserve. They haven't made it to an international stage. Not a lot of people from a lot of different regions know them very well. But these guys, these guys are legit. I think these guys have a, have a bright future ahead of them if they stick together and if they make it far into this tournament. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's Team Undying heading into TI-10. Uh, let me know what you guys think. How do you think they're gonna do? How do you think they're gonna hold up against the other teams? Do you think they're gonna able gonna be able to overcome the top teams in the league? Uh, let me know all your thoughts down below in the comment section. And uh, don't be uh, <laughs> please be sure to subscribe and share the video if you enjoyed. And I will see you guys next time, uh, where I will be going over uh, Fnatic of the uh, SEA region, Southeast Asia, the, the team that made it through the regional qualifiers there. So if you don't want to miss that, be sure to subscribe. And that should be coming out uh, next Monday. So, yeah. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye.